just went through the last presentation, uh, you guys now know that the ocean, uh, water is pretty much everywhere in the solar system, in space, and probably much outside of our galaxy too. But now I want to focus on water in, on our planet. Um, and just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a husky mom. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a student, actually, uh, at UCT and, uh, and another university as well in France. Um, I come from Mauritius and uh, I study upwellings and numerical modelling. <laughs> it's completely different from, from this. Uh, but I have been part of EGU before and last year I was in uh, Vienna, actually, and presented my research there. I also sometimes uh, for fun lecture at UCT and Rhodes and I'm also a big fan of going at sea and uh, we will probably, I'll probably mention sometimes the Essergolas at some point when I talk about Southern Ocean but uh, just as a, as a side note uh, for teachers we have this exciting program called Semester where it's also possible for teachers to get access to this amazing vessel, South African vessel that uh, we have in South Africa. Okay, so just now back to oceans uh, right now what we see. We know that, you know, if you look at those water molecules, you know that they've traveled a long, long, long journey to come where they are at your feet when you're at the beach and you know, just like the undertow current coming at you up and down. And um, these water molecules, we, there's a lot of research which go through, you know, trying to understand where it comes from, what, what's the journey that has happened to it. And as we know now, I mean, if tonight you look at the moon, you can look, you know, at the South Pole, we've got Chandrayaan-3, exploring other water, possible water that they can find there. And our story about uh, water on our planet starts possibly from a meteorite, asteroid, who knows exactly, they're still busy figuring this out. But our story starts from, you know, a lot of condensation, a lot of rain forming some uh, ancient super oceans. Some of them will look up potential hyperphysics. Some we have very strong evidence of it. As we all know, we're all, some, we're all scientists here. Science is a spectrum of truth. So some of the things I might say today is just a bit of truth and maybe a bit of missing link. And some we have a little bit more strong evidence of the truth that I'm trying to say here. So. If we, yeah, I want to talk about the past, some ancient oceans, some ancient hyperphysics and some ancient ones that we know have existed potentially, and talk a little bit about the present day as well, and also go a little bit in the future and see what potentially could happen in the future based on models that we can predict. Uh, so anything, uh, is everything okay? Just trying to turn the lights down. Oh, okay. So, to understand uh, how we travel back in time, okay, I want to also, yeah, that's better. Actually, the previous one was better, yeah. One more. Switches from the dark ages. That's like a whole cinema version now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, it's fine then. Okay, that's better. Okay, while, while she's figuring out, let's go on. Uh, I want to, first of all, why do you think we want to understand oceans in the past? What, uh, uh, what do you think? Throw me some answers. I know some of you must be geography teachers. I know some of maths and, and science, but well, why do you think we need to understand the ocean, especially from the past? Okay, 
Okay. Okay. Maybe our oceans have to be lived over time. Or yeah. Changed. But but why you want to understand, uh, especially in the past, like the changes to understand the future changes, maybe? Right. Okay. And then another. Qu an One more. Also, how the oceans move from place. Yeah. 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 Also, uh, so it's not about understanding ancient mermaid um, <coughs> civilization, no? Right. Okay. So I, for me, uh, to understand the ocean in the past is mostly about, especially life, because now we all know for evolution, life comes from the ocean. Okay. So that gives us more, you know, information about our own, you know, like evolution. Climate also is a big thing. Because and today every the big talk is climate change. So, as we know, just in South Africa, we have our Agulhas current and the Benguela current. They're all busy uh, influencing our climate, uh, and that can also help to understand uh, tectonic and continental drift as well, ocean currents and circulation, as one of you mentioned. But that also helps to understand the future as well, because we also now. When we understand the past, we can understand more what will happen in the future. And, and then obviously, I uh, mentioned some impacts on human, human history because, you know, in the past, if we're looking at hum human civilization as well, with sea level rise, but, you know, Sri Lanka and India, sometimes, you know, there's like, with sea level, you can understand how people were busy living their life back in the days. Um, so there's a lot of advantage in understanding uh, the oceans and there's been some major breakthrough first uh, going on actually a little bit even in the 1800 and there's a lot of obviously big scientists who have uh, <coughs> worked towards in trying to come up with some big theories to uh, understand ancient continents especially which has uh, been existing. Uh, and I think I just will mention, uh, I think Sir, Sir Alfred Wegener. Yeah. So it's a Sir, right? So uh, he's the one, I think in 1915, he actually publishes the thing, or but in 1912, he proposes this theory, you know, that, oh, okay, the continents were actually, it's all a puzzle and they're all kind of together or, you know, moving around <coughs> up and down. Some of you geography teachers or, yeah, okay, good. Yes, <laughs> uh, and um, and then uh, eventually in science, you know, little bits and pieces we br we add up more and more and more, and that theory gets even more. You know, now we're coming more to understanding. Yes, that's the truth. That's what's that's what's going on. And in the late twentieth century, we come up with more paleomagnetic research. You guys understand paleomagnetic. Uh, it's, I think in, in a nutshell, it's a bit like, uh, but maybe Professor Phil would explain that better. It's probably like a piece of puzzle, but they all have the same uh, magnetism uh, direction. And when you put them together, they're like, oh, that goes together. So let's put it together. So something like that. <laughs> uh, I'm not a geologist, so please forgive me. Uh, and so with more paleomagnetic research, that can bring up, bring up a little bit more evidence. And we'll talk a bit more about Rodinia uh, later on in the Iapetus uh, Ocean. And then obviously, 21st century, more and more technology in science. Now we have artificial intelligence, chat GPT, and everything like coming up next, next level. And I can't wait actually to see, because even in oceanography, into artificial intelligence is massive at the moment. And it's a hot topic. And it's actually bringing up a lot of great things. And I can't wait to see what it brings up when we're looking at uh, understanding the past. So in how by today, OK, for the total of all these uh, theories that we have, how has science helped us to, 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 to get to these, some of these answers to, to try and understand the past? Okay, so paleomagnetism, which was something I just mentioned earlier, alignment of magnetic minerals uh, in rocks. Uh, we have geological mapping, 
Okay, these are some, just some tools that I'm just going to mention how we, we kind of use to understand the past and uh, try to get be better answers. Sediment cores drill inside uh, any ice or a river, uh, anything like underneath. We bring up the core and then we send it to the lab and, and look at what pollen or what, whatever has been uh, in, the, in the core and we can understand, oh, that tree was chilling there. So, okay, so that was that type of tropical climate going on over there. <laughs> Uh, isotopic analysis is also a measure of ratios, different isotopes, maybe carbon, nitrogen, and you go a little bit into chemistry. We have this inc really good lab in UCT as well where we can do those kind of uh, experiments. Um, yeah, geochronology, that is a good uh, dating method. Uh, which can help understand when you know you hear big dates sometimes and people are always like oh but no but how do you know 3.2 million how do you know that time well it's actually using those uh, dating uh, techniques that helps us understanding uh, more closer when it was happening and then geophysical surveys paleoclimatology I'm just gonna go through these little tools very quickly geochemical traces, fossil record, the museum, satellite altimetry helps understand. Uh, basically, you can, through altimetry especially, you can understand uh, what's going on in your bathymetry, for instance. I'll take ocean as a good example, and we can understand where trenches are happening, uh, canyons, submarine canyons, ocean ridges, uh, and different things, and can Studying those ridges then can give more answers now. Seismic imaging, I think everybody heard about that when it ha we had the drama about, uh, what's the name of a, of a <laughs> shell, shell uh, coming to do some seismic imaging uh, in a uh, trans-sky shelf around there. Okay. Uh, it's not a bad thing, by the way, but this, uh, yeah. It's good for research also. Uh, numerical modeling and artificial intelligence. Um, this is the, the main, f I think like a lot of the future goes into that, I think. And I think if, uh, yeah, as you go in research, you really have to go a little bit into those numerical models and uh, these kind of fields, get into coding and talk to models to be able to understand more. But okay, so now that we have, we know now that the all these tools, so now let's look a bit at some, uh, what have we found out so far? And uh, what can we, what do we know about some ancient uh, super oceans or super continents first? And then what do we, yeah, what can be said from this uh, research? So there's a lot of, uh, well, agreement, disagreement. Remember, it's science, so there's still a lot of uh, research going on, as I said, and it's only a, a, a spectrum of truth, right? So we're not, we're not sure we're saying really, like, with certitude that, you know, hey, uh, existed three billion years ago, or um, Canolan. It's a potential hypothesis, but we seem to have agreements with a lot of research. Uh, maybe when it happened, that maybe, mm -hmm. but um, there's a lot of research going on. And then as we go closer, like Pangea, everybody's heard of Pangea, I'm sure. Then there's like way more uh, evidence as we're going closer, as you can see by the stars. Pangea probably, yeah, has all the, all the stars. Uh, so these are just uh, some ancient uh, possible supercontinents that I'm going to mention today. Uh, talking about Earth, Canolan, uh, Colombia, Rodinia, Panosia, Gondwana, and Pangaea. Okay. So, uh, yeah, as I said, and then uh, each of them, obviously, they had their, these were the supercontinent, and each of them had their if there's a, a landmass going on, obviously mm -hmm. there's like a super ocean had to cover the other side of the planet. So we're going to look at some of those 
oceans or super oceans which were existing back there. And some are like you can see, we're going to four billion years. So I did promise that we're time traveling amidst with the waves. So um, how, how uh, the, the ocean started, this kind of seem very basic, but it's probably just by, you know, condensation and rainfall and, you know, creating. I think, I think that's what happened and I think that's what so far we've figured out. But if we're talking four billion years, it's, yeah, we're still, I think, uh, that sounds like the most plausible uh, theory. Uh, and we have this hypothesis about a supercontinent called Vikinia, which were during the Archean era, uh, which potentially existed as a supercontinent and which said to have a lot of volcanoes in the time, okay? And maybe it had oceans also, you know, forming around, um, but there's very, very, it's, it's a hypothesis and it's very little information. And this is, we start at 4.2 to 3.2 giga annum, like billion years before. Uh, but uh, seems to be a hypothesis uh, that uh, seems to be mentioned a lot in the literature. Also Valbara as well. So we're going to talk about both. Uh, they both exist during the Archean era. And uh, it's, it was probably like that small, maybe. And obviously has this massive uh, super ocean. Uh, the, cr the, su the super continent in itself I mean, the continent in itself. I can tell you, I think parts of it, uh, the Creighton was, uh, forms part of South Africa and Western mm -hmm. Australia. That's a possible theory. But um, I think eventually, maybe in the next more years, we'll have more information on these things. So this we're looking at 3.2 to 2.8 billion mm -hmm. years ago, okay? And as we go next, we'll go on to Canolan, uh, which is now uh, onto the Proterozoic era. And this also led to the formation of a new, uh, it had bits and pieces from the previous <coughs> one, I think, but it also created this new one called Laurasia, and it had uh, North America and Greenland, you know, those areas forming up together. Um, and it seems to have been having fluctuations between, you know, an ice house and a greenhouse conditions. This is something also to think about. You know, we think about climate change all the time and we're like, oh, it's a disaster. <coughs> climate change has been happening for like ever, <coughs> but it's just now it affects us. That's why it's a problem. Before it was affecting whatever was living, uh, whatever was alive at the time. <laughs> Uh, and so potentially if this uh, supercontinent was existing, it would have broken, broken up eventually into uh, small fragments and forming the next one, which we're going to look at. So we look at Ur, Valbara and Ur were kind of like, you know, hypothesis and Canolan. And we now go on to Columbia or Nuna, which is around 1.41, <laughs> the one I found, or two two billion years ago, <laughs> okay? So now this one comes from maybe a breakup of a canolan one. And it also included land masses like, again, North America, Baltica, Siberia. I think some places are right, also North China as well and some part of Ukraine as well. And uh, so those the Columbia used to be like this massive supercontinent, which eventually they'll break up and form into this uh, another next supercontinent, Rodinia, which this one, we, we do have much more information about this one. So this one also experienced uh, some cooling phase and some warming <coughs> phase as well. Um, but we probably, this one, we probably know a little bit more uh, compared to the previous one. Now, I mentioned Rodinia. Rodinia was the landmass. Mirovia was the ocean. 
Okay, so Rodinia was the supercontinent which just comes right after Colombia and it was surrounded by this vast uh, super ocean now called Mirovia. And what is interesting about uh, Mirovia is that around some places I've read it 600 million years ago, but uh, maybe it's more. Uh, we had this snowball effect, like a, like a very extreme cooling phase which occurred. And this is uh, potentially what led to the breakup of uh, this Rodinia supercontinent that was going on at the time. And as it would break up, <laughs> it would form another one called Panosia, and also possibly then we'll look at other oceans which now can be formed. So now we are in the 1.3 to 0 0.9 billion. So let's look at the after the snowball effect. So we go into Panosia. Panosia is this other uh, supercontinent existing right after this snowball effect. As I just mentioned, we had a big extreme cooling uh, effect. But this one tends to be a bit more temperate uh, conditions. And uh, it also had its uh, Panosha Ocean. I think that was the name. I think the supercontinent was actually Panosha and then the name Panosha Ocean. And uh, so it now it stabilizes a bit to more temperate condition, but eventually uh, as you go more into just a few years, uh, it will have some rapid sea level change and dramatic climate change going on and this leads to some ocean chemistry changes in the ocean and that will lead to the next breakup of this supercontinent which now we move on onto the pan-african ocean now you guys have heard about gondwana i mean if you've done a tour of a museum i think you would have heard of that name gondwana supercontinent uh, now we're talking about the Gond now we're in the era of the Gondwana. Uh, so the Pan-African Ocean, it was formed during the assembly of the Gondwana, and <coughs> it has a lot of uh, areas like you know Africa, India, uh, and along with a collision of these land masses, eventually it's going to form to the next one. We're coming to the next one, which is Pangaea, which everybody this one we all know about it. Uh, we also have potentially had other oceans like rake oceans around it um, and uh, as it's going to break up also again we're going to have more uh, gateways for new oceans which will possibly be found. So Iapetus uh, is the one which existed possibly 600 to 400 million years that was also a, a, around the Gondwana era. And this also was during a time when there's been, you know, upcycle and downcycle of glacial and warming period uh, of the climate. And Iapetus is a bit of a, I think it's a bit of an ancestor of the Atlantic Ocean, <coughs> actually. So now, as we go after that, we move on to Pangaea. So Pangaea is probably the most famous one uh, continent which existed because we have a lot of evidence also about it. And uh, the, the, the ocean surrounding uh, Pangaea is Pantalassa. Now even uh, I have a friend of mine doing a PhD actually on Pantalassa. Uh, so even we have so much evidence, you know, that we can we have a lot of research going on into it. So this existed, you know, during the time when um, if a dinosaur wants to go to Germany, they don't need to apply for a visa, you know, it's so just Oh, walks. they need to apply for no, a visa. No, no, they just like, they just like it's walk. After all. They just like walk, right? <laughs> you just walk. So uh, this is a time obviously yeah when dinosaurs uh, were probably existing at the time and uh, so Pangaea is uh, like centered at the equator and then it's surrounded by this uh, big ocean but also probably Paleotephys, I'm going to mention Tephys later and then the subsequent Tephys oceans. Um, 
And the Pan Pantalassa's closure marked the breakup of Pangaea and then the opening of some new ocean basins, which now then eventually will come to Atlantic Ocean. Uh, but the large side, you, you, you would think it's a simple ocean and you would think that oh, it's just like stagnant, you know, nothing really big going on. But that, that doesn't seem to be the case when we look at models. Um, there seem to be a lot of things going on in Pantalessa. So I didn't put everything, but we have a northern side and a southern side and a western side of Pantalessa where there was quite some circulations, actions going on. We have upwellings going on uh, in Pantalessa. And I'm so amazed about the discoveries that we can find and, and I actually really want to read more about these things, uh, this kind of paleo-oceanographic research. So, yeah, I don't think it was a simple super ocean, just stagnant like that. There was a lot more uh, dynamics going on. Who knows what sort of eddies were going on, upwellings, currents. Uh, yeah, so that sounds promising. And I think we can have more answers eventually very soon. And I mentioned the Tethys Ocean as well, which also was occurring. Uh, this one also evolved as Pangaea was like slowly starting to break up, then uh, into the, from like Laurasia and Gondwana. And the Tethys Ocean eventually it closed uh, from like the collision of African and Eurasian plates. And that's like reaching those uh, rise of these Alpine and Himalayan mountain ranges. And then Next, we have the Atlantic Ocean, which is still here. Um, that kind of began as Pangaea started breaking up. Um, it's a lot of breakups going on in here. Uh, so as Pangaea started breaking up and leading to separation uh, of Americas from Europe and Africa. So this is now we're at 175 million years ago. OK, we're going to now go a little bit Closer to the present, okay, Drake Passage. Do you guys know where Drake Passage is? Uh, if you're on a, looking at a map, okay, you have Antarctica and South America. That's the part where I'm talking about, okay. And also, also, have you guys heard about the Antarctic Circumpolar Current? So it's actually at our doorstep in South Africa. So South Africa has three main ocean currents. We have a Benguela current, which sits on the, uh, like towards Namibia side, that side. And then we have a Gullis current flowing from Durban, Mozambique. And the Antarctic Circumpolar current is the one just a little bit down off the Marion Island uh, mm -hmm. around there. And remember I'd mentioned the S.A. Gullis ship. So we use the Sagalus ship to go study the Antarctic circumpolar current. And actually, South Africa is very, very hugely involved in understanding uh, the current situations of the Antarctic circumpolar current. OK, this is just to tell you that these parts of research, when it comes to understanding the ACC, Antarctic circumpolar current, South Africa has a big hand into it. Um, so now we're at 50 million years ago, okay, and this is where now you start seeing the formation of this particular current, okay, and obviously this also uh, have like significant changes now in the circulation of the ocean and its climate as well. Okay, so now that we've looked a bit at the past, okay, now I want to look a bit at the present. Do we know what's going on a little bit in the present situation with regards to our oceans? <coughs> yeah? What, what do you think is happening to our oceans? Yes, why? Yeah, that's a big talk, climate change. But you saw that climate change has been happening all the time. Yeah. But it's still happening because of us also now, so yes. Uh, I think let's ask later, maybe. Um, 
but you guys are not really answering. So what do we know right now about the ocean circulation? Okay, so at the moment, now this is where I understand more. <laughs> We have a lot of ocean currents going on and circulation, you know, which helps uh, regulate our climate from the effect of the wind. You know, there's a lot of movement going on in the ocean. And as I had just mentioned, uh, down at South Africa, you see the red and the blue arrow. OK, and there's a lot of other different uh, currents going on. So. I'm just going to mention some quick currents right now, uh, like the Gulf Stream is actually the most famous ocean current. Okay, um, so the Gulf Stream is it's it's a warm western boundary current. Okay, and the problem what's going on right now uh, we see climate change, but it's weakening. Okay, <coughs> and it's getting uh, it's weakening the actually it's weakening the Atlantic Meridional overturning circulation among. It's weakening that circulation because it's getting even more warmer, and that has massive, massive consequences. Well, massive when I talk now, when you just look at what has happened in the past, maybe. But it has massive consequences if you want to stay alive for the next <coughs> hundred years. So including sea levels, as someone mentioned, and life, marine ecosystem, you know, oxygen, carbon. The, the ocean is hugely important because it also, you know, um, gives us a lot of our oxygen to breathe. Do you guys know that 70% of your, all your oxygen that you breathe comes from the ocean, right? So it also takes up a lot of this carbon that we're emitting um, you know, in the atmosphere, and it can, you know, store all of that. So anyway, so that's why it's very important to also understand what's going on right now with the ocean, and this can have a warming effect of this Gulf Stream is going to have um, some really severe consequences in terms of circulations and climate also. If we j remember, I just mentioned the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. Um, so it's actually the largest current. Uh, and yeah, and, and again, I want to mention <coughs> South Africa is the place to study the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. At UCT, we're very big onto research onto this one. Uh, but yes, as again, as, as uh, uh, with increasing temperature, uh, its behavior is obviously changing with melting. And it obviously has a huge effect on uh, the circulation all around it. If we look at some currents in the north, we have uh, Caruso, which is a western boundary current. Um, all of these are kind of warming up, OK? And then we have a California current system. And there's like different wind patterns because of different pressure system. Now, Increase the surface temperatures, and again, all of these are like causing a lot of changes in our oceans. <coughs> Same for uh, equatorial Pacific current, for instance. We have heard about El Nino and La Nina, mm -hmm. right? Okay, that increases again more <coughs> temperature because more flooding or you know more drought uh, at different places between Australia and Peru. So if we look a little bit, uh, what can possibly happen in the future? Uh, and again, this all comes from uh, understanding, you know, using some tools to understand the past and then applying those tools in models to help predict um, something. We, let's first look at some ongoing current tectonic change, what's going on in Africa, Himalayas, how can that change our, con our, our different continents that we have at the moment? And then let's look at some future super ocean that could potentially happen. Uh, you guys know that Africa is breaking? Yes. Yeah. OK. So around Somalia and stuff, we have some, again, another breakup happening there. 
Uh, and the, the disk can obviously eventually, as this happens, um, we probably will, ex will uh, experience, obviously not us, I don't know what life form will probably be existing around there if we still make it, but uh, this will obviously change the coastline and we could have a new ocean basin actually. And Iceland is also a place which has a lot of volcanoes. I mean, it's in between, if you look at a map, in between uh, two big continental plates. And what's going on at the moment, it's moving us out. Actually, there's a place you can visit. You can even walk around there. Uh, and with these uh, plate divergence, and this could uh, widen our Atlantic Ocean, and this has potential effects on then what will actually happen to our currents. Uh, we have on the Ring of Fire, heard of that. Uh, we have also a lot of uh, potential volcanoes, volcanoes which can happen, can create new islands, new islands forming, there's potential different <coughs> consequences on what will happen in the ocean with circulation, etc. And Himalayan as well, those are more like uplift of Himalayas. And with that, that could alter the chemistry of because the, the water feeds in uh, the Ganges and all these other rivers feeding into the Indian Ocean and that could al alter the chemistry. And we also have a Red Sea, okay? This could widen the Red Sea. And we also have other potential uh, volcanic activity and ocean chemistry which can occur in uh, the South America areas. So there's a lot actually currently going on and this is how actually when, when we say, you know, a big breakup is happening or a big uh, amalgamation of land mass is happening, it's like slow, obviously. So these are currently what we can already see what's going on. And there are some hypotheses about some future super ocean, super continent which could exist. Um, here I've listed like Nova Pangea uh, and Amasia Ocean. So there's this uh, potential um, Nova Pangea which could exist. This one, it would take like uh, assumption if like Pacific is like closing and then it would dock around Australia and East Asia and then a bit of like Antarctica. But again, these are very like, you know, hypothesis. And then we have uh, Amasia, which is a potential future supercontinent which could <coughs> exist by merging Asia and Americas together. So, yeah, this is, this is my presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, what, what's your favorite supercontinent of the future, Shavina? Oh, there was another one, Nova Pan uh, Proxima, I think. Uh, Oh my word, maybe, maybe the Nova Pangea, maybe? Okay. I would like, I mean, I'm just curious to know about the oceans, how the currents oh, will be, you okay. know? What life form will be in there? Right. Maybe we evolve and become mermaids and, and go into, <laughs> get into them. It's about time. It's yeah. 200 million, we're talking 200 million years. Okay. So who knows, if, you know, what do we become after that? Any questions? Yes. yes, please. Yes, I just wanted to know um, how did they determine the years of when it started? How did they determine it's 50 million years, 200 million years? Radio I would say radiocarbon dating, there's so many other methods. I, I don't know exactly for each one. Um, which uh, dating method they use, but there's a lot of dating methods that we use. We use different, it's more like chemistry, and I think Professor Phil maybe can answer yeah, that. So more. it's mostly things like uranium lead, like there's a mineral zircon that contains uranium, which as we all know is radioactive, but it doesn't contain any lead when it's formed. And then over time, some of that uranium decays to lead. And that, and we know the half-life, we know how long it takes to decay, and so we can get very precise ages using that. That's probably the main tool. 
Yeah, the decay is like, we know it's a set amount of time, that's why we can tell, oh, it's that set amount of time it took to become this other thing. And, Not and clear. The newspapers, which we find next to the dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm exactly. sure. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I would I measure time. I think yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions, please? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a statement because it's it's we're talking about climate change and all of that. But another thing that could have a fact could affect the current <coughs> is that Earth still is not Milankovic going to stay the same yeah. till mm. it's gonna the seasons are eventually yes. going to change. So that, that does actually uh, that did come up when I was oh. researching that I just didn't add it in the but you're talking about Milankovic uh sex twenty three I think something. Are oh, you talking about that? That's called Milan. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's the tilt. I've, yeah. But but that did that does have an effect. Yes. There was a question over here. Yeah, the, I'm quite interested in the impact of the Antarctic circumpolar current on in the in the near future. Mm. In our area. I. All I know is that it's it's uh, warming up. I don't know too much about this. I'm more like onto an Agulhas current person, but uh, yeah, I don't have like I, I just know on the big thing that at at in UCT there's a lot of students who do research on that, and there's a lot of uh, actually there's two things. Uh, some scientists agree that it's warming up, and then some. A little bit of scientists agree that actually it's not warming up, it's getting colder. That's also a, a, a thing. And even IPCC suggested that, hey, some scientists are saying this, but we agree that it's warming up. So there's actually a debate on that. But I don't know too much about it, to be honest. I just, I just want to say that it is getting colder. <laughs> 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 in To be, to be honest, and <laughs> I'll, I'll talk from their perspective, the reason why they don't have an answer is because the only time you can study the Antarctic Circumpolar and go the ship and bring the equipment there and study it is during uh, summertime, not during winter time. Winter time you can only go to 50 degrees latitude or something. Summer you can go all the way to Antarctica. So that's, that's one of those uh, limitation where we have to rely on other satellite and models and other things and then the answers come sometimes from models or other things and it's vague but yeah. One more question. Yeah, thank you very much and, uh, and really I, I really appreciate uh, your activities and insight into really what is happening globally. I'm interested in the the effect of that uh, break that uh, you're saying that it's, it's happening slowly but surely. Which one? Africa, the one you're saying Africa is break. Somalia and, and yes. yeah. Yes, I'm interested in, I'm asking now from the perspective of the, somebody who works in a museum <coughs> who probably has interest in the, in, in, um, you know, uh, in the, the collection of fossils. And I would like to know uh, what what would be the, the effect of that in the in the fossilization process. You know, most fossils have to stay in the ground for a certain period, mm. and then mm. and, and you will see more now as it as it. Yeah, and, and, and what, what you know, what are the effects of that break of, of what's happening there? How will it affect the that process of fossilization? Fossilization, and also. How will that affect the human interaction with the space and also the interaction between cultures in the area that is affected by these, uh, you know, uh, geo, you know, these changes in terms of, you know, the surface and also climate. Okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, humans. I think the only way it can affect is in terms. Obviously, this is we're not talking tomorrow or even next hundred years that it's happening. This is like a slow process, but the slow process would involve some earthquakes and some, 
movements going on. That's how I see it impacting human civilization at the moment. Fossils thing, uh, the preservation if you're talking, I I don't know. <laughs> because also you have to think which humans will be around when it has come out and then look at the fossil. Are we still around? Who wants to be around? Guys? Yeah. <laughs> we have three, four volunteers here. <laughs>